Dashilazzo, Dashilazzo from the Mosul of China. I, I would invite to the panel Patricia Mukim from the Kasi of Northeast India. And I would invite, invite to the panel Savitri de Turey from the Nayar Kerala of Southwest India. This panel is also a split one, it's a longer panel because we then continue with um, Peggy Reeves Sandy. Oh Peggy, come, come to the panel too, please. Peggy Reeves Sandy. And Nico Vita Mali from the Nankabao Vivaka, Indonesia. We have again, again a big panel, so we will have a split, a break in between, and I think you now know the system. We will have the discussion with questions and answers at the end, when the second part of this panel um, has taken place. As we tell. Before we start, I have an announcement. Uh, Sally? Sally here. Sally? No. So I start with my announcement, and then Sally will come and ask a short information for you too. According to the program, after this long and very interesting day, there's no evening program. It was my opinion, but it changed. <laughs> but you know, the evening programs are free. If you are tired, you must not attend them, but you are invited to attend them. It, it happened by... Um, in the process of the Congress, it, um, it developed. About 8 o'clock, uh, Maureen, Maureen Gosling is invited to show her, her film about what she the losses of the fire. And afterwards, all the persons who will discuss the problem with Walmart being constructed in Ho Chi Tan are invited, invited to be present. This is a political problem which is really urgent for the women of Kuchitan, and so we took this special part, this special evening program in for this time. And Rosa Marta Toledo from the Kuchiteka woman wanted to say some words about this problem to you now and tell you what's going on. Please, Rosa Marta Toledo, about what is going on this evening. I'd like to make an invitation to you, each one, personally, that you join us this evening for a beautiful film called Blossoms of Fire. Um, this is what I'm asking or I'm appealing to you as your donation. I know we're all very tired. Pero, eh, bueno, la película es una película muy interesante. It's extremely interesting footage. Sobre la, la vida de las mujeres en Cuchitán. About the lives of the Cuchitecan women, of whom we have here an example. Y la otra donación que quiero pedirles. And the other donation I'd like to ask for. Son ideas. Ideas. O experiencias que tengan relacionadas con Walmart. Experiences that you may offer to me to take back to my uh, town regarding how we can deal with the Walmart issue. Que puedan ayudar a, a que pues mi pueblo de alguna manera encuentre el camino para salvarnos de este monstruo. That perhaps we could all hold hands and that you could help my people solve this uh, problem as I referred to it yesterday as a corporate monster. Así que muchísimas gracias. Thank Está you. Bien, gracias. Thank you.
Now I open our panel, which is dedicated to the present matriarchal societies of Asia. Our first speaker is, is, is at once the youngest speaker of this Congress, is Dashi Latsu from the Mosul people. She is 27, 27 years. <laughs> she comes in her traditional costume of the young, the young women of the Mosul, the festival costume of the young women of the Mosul. Yeah. Right. I know it. <laughs> I'm happy to see this again because I did my field work with the Mosul and I had the pleasure to, to uh, meet the women in their wonderful costumes. They look for me like princesses or queens in their costumes, their traditional costumes. So I have a special relationship to the Muslim people with well, because I did feel work there, and I'm so glad that you are here, Dashi Lazzo. She was born in Laoni, Ling Lang, in 1978. Yes. She went to her village elementary school, and then she, she was chosen to go to a top class in Tuodia. In 1990, Ling Lang Number first, middle school accepted her according to her highest score in the entrance, in entrance examination in her area. There she spent six years and fulfilled her middle school. In 1996, she went to Yunnan Institute for Nationalities in Kunming. Right after her graduation in 2000, she went back to her country city to become a teacher in Ninglang, number one middle school. In December 2003, she got Ford Foundation Fellowship from International Fellowship Program. From January 2004 till now, she is at the College of St. Rose to study on her master's degree in Educational Administration Program. Welcome, Dashi. and this is my first time to give a um, presentation. So I need your encouragement and what you can do for me is, if you would, please make some noise for me. <laughs> Challenges in part four, protection of culture, earth. Um, due to the develop, development of the technology, if you put Mosul on Google, you will find tremendous information about Mosul people. However, every time I find something online or in books, there's lots of incredible wrong information. What is more, in some way, I feel that my people are deserted. Sometimes I love, sometimes I'm curious, and sometimes I find this reaction painful. First of all, when people talk about Mosul people, they are talking about the people who live in the Ruku Lake area. As you can see, 
from the um, screen. This is a part, this is a Lugu Lake. <clears throat> but actually, most of people live in both Yunnan and Sichuan provinces. In Yunnan, about 13,000 most of people reside in places like Lugu Lake. As I mentioned, Lugu Lake is, this is Lugu Lake. And uh, Yongning, this here, oh. here's Yongning. And oh. this place, is called Labo, where I come from. And other, other people in Yunnan province reside in the Milan County city area, around here. And another one, 10,000 most of people inhabit Zhuosuo in Sichuan province. As you can see from here, Lugu Lake is divided into two parts. Okay, this part is belong to Yunnan province, and the other one is belong to Sichuan province. Second, people are very curious about my people. They think we most women can have sex with a lot of them, a lot of men, and our children do not know who their fathers are. Especially after the publication of Miss Yartin Lama's book, The Walk from Girls' Kingdom. Most readers of this book misinterpret the visiting marriage and sexual relationships with seven different men described in her book by her and simply concluded that most of women are just like Yarchana and have lots of different sexual partners. This book influenced me a lot when I was in college. People came to me and asked me how many lovers I have and whether I knew who my father is. I had a difficult time explaining to them what was really going on. Today, through this speech about most of family structure, I hope people will get a better understanding of my culture and will respect us most of people. And on the other hand, I also understand there are researchers who have an interest in the matriarchal family who are doing very good research. They provide much accurate information and contribute to an understanding of my culture. <coughs> I do appreciate what they have done, but deep in my heart, I always feel there is something still lacking. I really I really appreciate that the World Congress has given me this great opportunity to explain what I am as a native Mosul people, what I know about my own people. I do not claim to be an expert on multiple study, but as a native Mosul person, I can talk about my people from my own perspective. Therefore, at the suggestion of Ms. Heidi, I will discuss Mosul family structure briefly. To talk about Mosul family structure, no doubt that we have to talk about marriage. Marriage systems are influenced by the development of society, not only the economy, but also politics. Many people think of Mosul people are practicing visiting marriage. I don't agree. Actually, in different Mosul areas, there are different kinds of marriage systems. And these different marriage systems lead to different family structures. The men the main system is visiting marriage, practiced by 16% of Mosul people, which conforms to a matriarchal family structure. In the second marriage system, patriarchy and matriarchy coexist in a complex Mosul family structure. Lastly is patriarchal family structure, which is most, co most common in China and the rest of the world. Um, visiting marriage system is, and its family structure. Visiting marriage presents the main marriage system, including Sichuan, Zhuosu, and Yongning area. In this kind of marriage, men and women spend their whole life with their own respective matriarchal families. In the evening, after having dinner in his own home, the man will go and stay with his sexual partner during the night. The next morning he will go back home. The men and women involved in visiting marriage adjust each other as lovers. Their relationship is not like that of a husband and a wife. They are simply sexual partners. This kind of marriage involves no legal or economic relationships. The authors, the mother's side of the family is responsible for the upbringing of any children in this kind of relationships. 
A mosu mochiaco family is normally made up of three or four generations, all of whom are descendants of a common great mother, great grandmother. They all share the same surname, which comes from their mother. Property is shared between them. A woman of high moral standard and, le and learning is selected to be in charge of family affairs. Most of the people call this woman Nabu. Nabu is responsible for putting food on the table and dealing with important family issues. The male members of the family will give all the earnings to Nabu, and Nabu will decide, decide what present partners shall give their sexual partners when they meet at night. In chart one, as you can see in the screen, the Dabu is the oldest woman in this family named Bimalama. There is a man named uh, Hei Dwazu visiting her during the night, and they produced five children who were brought up in Bimalama's family. Among the children, there are two daughters and three sons. The sons visiting visit other women, and the sexual partners families will bring up their children. Akakuchu and Bimami visit these two girls, Jachuma and Tidashi. This visit will lead to five more children in this family. Later on in life, other men will visit their daughters. For example, Dash is visiting Aja, who is the daughter of Jachuma. In this way, the Machuaka family is continued. Coexisting marriage system and its family structure. Most of people live in very remote areas. Average altitude is above 2,500 meters. Our living environments are quite harsh. Most of people, most most of people, except those who live around Lugu Lake, earn money. All of us live off the land. As a result, the marriage system can be adjusted to adapt to the living environment. This can lead to a mixed marriage system in which patriarchal and matriarchal family structure coexist. This kind of marriage system mostly happen in the labor area where the environment are more difficult. For instance, there is often no electricity and the water supply is inadequate. The couples might first practice visiting marriage in this area, then after negotiation, they will then plan to marry and stay together. There are two possible, possible family structures. One is in the youngest generation of this family is all sons, or alternatively, one generation of the family is all daughters. Let's first talk about one generation only has sons. In this situation, they have to find a girl to continue this family so in the future she can take charge of family affairs. So, so they find a girl to marry one of the sons. In chart two, um, in the oldest generation, Jachuma is practicing visiting marriage. She produced two sons, to, um, Dashinongu and Asa. In order to continue this family, they find a girl, Iji, to marry one of their sons. Then Asa and Iji have two daughters. Those two daughters may practice visiting marriage again. And the other son, Dashinobu, is likely to practice visiting marriage also. So in this family, um, the patriarchy and the matriarchy is coexisting. Look at the other situation. Uh, what the younger generation only has daughters. They need men. In this kind of family, they need men to fetch firewood from the mountains and plug the, plow the field. Men are needed for their labor. In this case, a family generation which has only girls has to find a man to marry one of the girls so that the family can have a better life. In chapter 3, the mother pr practices visiting marriage. She has produced three daughters. One of, the, one of them, Archima, is married to um, Gumadashi, a man the family has found to be her husband. Um, Jaaduma, the other daughter, is practicing visiting marriage with third dish. This actually is the example of my own family. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, the last family is um, pure patriarchal marriage system and its family structure. 
The patriarchal marriage system is similar to the uh, marriage system in the rest of China. For most of people who live around Ningluang County, such as people who live in Yang Ba, Xinyin Pan, and the people like me who work out of Muslim communities, follow this kind of marriage system. We have to have a marriage certificate to, in order to live together in the cities. In chapter 4, um, Dumami and Adami are married to Wu Tseni and uh, Luzo Duji. Uh, Gazo Majun is another family that married uh, Ter Duji. So this is a very typical um, patriarchal family in China. Now let's um, look at what is the facing challenges. Just 10 years ago, the local government decided to open Mosul culture to the outside world to enable local Mosul people to have a better life. All of a sudden, the Mosul area became a tourist destination. At present, the Mosul culture faces great challenges because of this development strategy. In undeveloped areas like Lugu Lake, cultural resources are in jeopardy. The local governments want to increase the economic economy quickly, but not able to protect culture because they are not regarded as contributing to the overall economy. It is estimated that 20 or 280 to 300 thousand people are going to the local lake area every year, where less than 1 thousand Muslim people live. Local, most local people cannot handle the impact caused by the opening of the culture to the outsiders. The, the local residents themselves will come people from outside world who are willing to pay to, pay to glimpse culture that are thousands of years old. They will feel that it's easy way to earn money. If their everyday lifestyles have become an attraction for other people who prefer to spend time and money to come and look, they will be pleased. The com combination of all the above facts result in a dimin diminution and abuse of cultural resources. There is no driving force to improve or change the situation, let alone optimize the use of cultural resources. Even though the economic base in these areas has improved very rapidly, most of culture is vanishing very quick. Because of the tourism, most of people are influenced by the outsiders and the family structure is changing dramatically. The Muslim matriarchal family is dying out. Probably it will disappear in a few years. With the development of technology and economic change, the people's consciousness is experiencing great change too. Some Muslim people no longer value our own culture. Young Muslim people are unavoidably impacted by outside culture. For me, this is a positive development. Then there is the educational system. As I said before, most of people live in mountains. After the um, required minimal education, they, could, they can't pay for the tuition, most of them. So they drop out and find a job instead. Girls find jobs easily, such as cleaners, babysitters, and other low-skilled jobs in the cities. With most of girls working, only the old and the very young and some of the men stay at home. What happened to the matriarchal family? And what happened to the Muslim family structure? Muslim areas like funds and technical expertise to protect our cultural heritage. Most importantly, we need investment to protect our cultural resources. But the government budget is squeezed. Statistics show that the central government now boasting about 400,000 cultural sites, including 750 sites under the state province top protection and 99 renowned historic sites in the western area. Of course, most of culture is included. And the central government is trying to do better. But it, it seems that the local government is not paying good attention in protecting cultural resources. Furthermore, non-governmental investment haven't been available on a large scale. I'm not a governor. It is impossible for me to find a great way to change the situation, uh, situation immediately. 
However, I do love my people and my own culture from the bottom of my heart. That is why I always worry so much about the disappearance of my culture. I'm not a cynic, but I do not think we can completely rely on the government. <laughs> just a small group of people compared with the 56 other ethnic groups in China. Our voice is too weak to be heard. As far as I know, most, of people, most of culture is unique in the world, and the world has a stake in preserving it. For us, it is a matter of just survive. At present, there are some organizations around Lugu Lake trying to preserve most of culture. I wish them will, but they are not very effective. I'm going to graduate in December, this December, and I cannot wait to go back to my hometown. I hope I can devote myself to education because I do believe that education is the most important thing to my people. At the same time, I'm willing to contribute to most of culture preservation and development. I'm very willing to do the following things with partners. Uh, starting an art program in which older people can teach the younger generation Asian songs and the dance heritage. Create an uh, education program to teach children uh, who is in four to seven years old Muslim language and initiate a program to reduce the current student's job rate. Being a Muslim begin a Muslim religion project. For me, this is so urgent. It is so close to my heart. We have no written language as Mosul people, but we educate Mosul people through oral speech in the Ndaba religion. I do not want our oral tradition to disappear for the coming generation. I want to try my best to protect it. And I, will, I also want to find a performance group to dance and sing for tourists so they have a chance to understand Mosul culture a little bit more. And lastly, I want to open a data center to collect the and store information on culture and the environment. <laughs> However, to protect culture requires not only money but also technology expertise. Modern technology should be used in protecting our precious cultural heritage. We should record and reserve, preserve as much as we can in print, photographs, recording, and videos. Set up a folklore village and museums and establish institution, institutions to preserve and study ethnic cultures. I know I have given you an ambitious agenda, but I can not do it alone and I will come your help and uh, enjoy to a visit in Girls' Kingdom. Thank you for your listening. Our next speaker is Patricia Mukim. She comes from the Kasi in Northeast India, Northeast India. She was born in 1953 in Shiloh, Meghalaya, in Northeast India and is a renowned columnist and social activist. She is currently the director of Indigenous Women's Resource Center, whose mandate is to train and to build the 
capacities of indigenous women of the northeast province of India, a region largely inhabited by hill tribes with a strong cultural affiliation to the people of Southeast Asia. Coming from the Kazi matrilineal society, Patricia has interpreted her society to the rest of India and the world through her writing, writings and independent research. For her free and frank views and her commitment towards a liberal democratic ethos espoused through the columns of leading newspapers in her state and the country, Patricia was conferred the Padma Shri, a national award in recognition of her social services by the President of India in March 2000. Earlier in 1996, she won the Shamil Devi Jain Award for Outstanding Women Media Person. In 2003, Patricia joined the Northeastern Institute of Development Studies at the Northeastern Hill University as research advisor. Patricia has supervised several research projects relating to the function of traditional institutes, visa constitutional institutions in democratic societies and the changing dynamics of a matrilineal society. A widely traveled person, Patricia has on several occasions been designated speaker at several national and international conferences. Thank you very much, friends, and I'd like to thank especially the gentlemen in this conference for their for being so kind. I'm not uh, an academic, and therefore I was quite perturbed by that question put earlier on about the need to fit matriarchal societies into a definite paradigm because I think that notion itself is very patriarchal. And, uh, because I think that academic theories develop after studying societies and not the other way around. <laughs> and the more, you, the more of matriarchal or matrilineal societies that you study, the more you can expand the scope of matriarchy. And I am definitely very grateful to the organizers for bringing me here all the way, 22 hours of flying. But it's really wonderful to connect to different people of different colors, regions, societies. I'm really, really grateful. And it has also made me see that my society is not so unique after all because there are so many societies that practice the same thing as we do. And this is, this is really a, a revelation for a Khasi to be connecting with others who share the same kind of social practice. are one of 238 ethnic groups in that small region and our origin is very mysterious. Some scholars say and scholars, I mean you cannot say that this is a scholarly thing because it's a legend. We believe that we were 16 families that lived in heaven and seven families came down to earth for farming. And there was one amongst those seven who was a sinner and cut off the, you know, the tree that connected us to heaven. It was the heavenly navel. And so the seven families, the Khasis remained on earth. And we call ourselves the seven huts, the Hinyo Trep, Hinyo Skum. 
We are a population of less than a million and we have an oral tradition because our script was given to us only in 1842 by a missionary called Thomas Jones. Khasis, uh, we believe we have descended from the Mon Khmer uh, groups of people in Cambodia. We are matrilineal in that the descent is traced from the female line. There is a clear distinction between the matri kinship and the patri kinship groups. The matri kinship groups, that is, that is the group that, uh, you know, like if I am the mother, my children, my grandchildren, that's a matri kinship group, is called the kur, we belong to one clan. And the group that is the patri kinship group, say of my father and his sisters and his mother, that's called the kha, the kur and the kha. And every clan traces its descent to the great, great grandmother or the Yao Bei. People of one clan are called Shi Kun. I think all that will be in my paper, so you need not try and absorb because after this I think it's very heavy to absorb all these technicalities. The Khasi home is a home where you have the grandmother, the daughters, the grandchildren, all living together. I come from such a family. I am the only daughter of my parents. But I have four children and three grandchildren. And of the four children, three of them, including my married daughter, lives with me with her two children and her husband. But my son, who married the youngest daughter, has had to leave his home and live with his wife in his wife's natal home. Marriage between members of the same clan is a taboo and it's considered very, very, um, what should I say, it's very bad and we, the Khasis believe that anyone who marries somebody from the same clan will be killed either by lightning or thunder or be eaten by a lion or something like that. The Khasi societies place great stress on matri solidarity which is reinforced by the concept of the house, the home or kayeng as we call it. This home is the center of all rituals. It is the natal home, it is the rallying point for all the members of the family to meet, to discuss. It is the place where you have a sort of a small social community of your own and it brings cohesion because it allows the children of different relatives to come together to meet with one another so that they recognize who their relatives are from the same clan and do not get into any kind of romantic relation with them. And this helps in avoiding taboo. The Khasi elders, especially the women who is the matriarch in this case, especially the youngest daughter for whom the home is an institution. She transmits teachings to, the, to her own uh, children, her children's children, her elder sister's children and so on. And these codes of good conduct are called Jings Neng Timmet. They are oral tradition, they are given orally. And they are the basis of Khasi faith which says Kamai Yakahok, which means earn righteousness. While you are on this earth, your duty is to earn righteousness. And the next one is Tibbril Tibblay. You first have to know your fellow human beings, then only you can know your God. For the Khasis, funerals, deaths, weddings, and naming ceremonies are occasions for family gathering. The eldest maternal uncle plays the role of the priest and the youngest daughter who is his niece is a very important part of that worship of that ceremony because she has to bring all the materials required for that ceremony. And we believe that it is very important not to offend the family deity that we worship 
and that if the family deity is offended, then we might fall into sickness, some misfortune, and so on. The Kaddu, as I said earlier, the youngest daughter, she is the center of religious observance, but she is not the priestess. It's the uncle who is the priest. The Khasis cremate their dead, and the funeral rites are very expensive because the bones have to be interned in an osiery and there are many rituals uh, <coughs> connected with that. The home again is not only a social unit, it's an economic unit because it is in that home that you know you, you assess the quantum of land that you have as a family and that land is distributed to different members of the family even to boys. That is, if the family has enough land, otherwise the girls get first preference. The youngest daughter, the Khadbo again, is the custodian of family property. All ancestral property passes through the youngest daughter. She is the custodian because she has to look after, she has great responsibilities. She has to look after her aged parents till their death. All her unmarried brothers and sisters stay with her. If any of her brothers or sisters are divorced, they come back and stay in her natal home. If any of her nieces and nephews are orphaned, she has to look after them. Therefore, she has a very huge responsibility for which she loses her social mobility. The youngest daughter in a Khasi family finds it very difficult to leave her home and to take up a job elsewhere. And very often, you know, these days it is not a very homogeneous society. We are mixing with other societies and sometimes the Khaddo marries outside her community. That becomes a great problem because then she'll have to leave her community and her place will be taken by her next sister in line. Now the advantages of being in a matrilineal society. And I see these advantages when I compare myself to other patriarchal societies. I don't think we can see advantages or disadvantages if we compare ourselves to ourselves. The advantage is that it's the woman who perpetuates her plan. We do not have a dowry system as compared to the larger Indian society. Unmarried women are under no pressure to marry and we find that more and more uh, professional, professionally employed young women are not wanting to marry. Marriage is never arranged, it is by choice and cohabitation is an accepted part of Khasi society. We only learned about the sanctity of marriage after Christianity came. Before that, it was okay to live together. And that's why we never had this uh, uh, social ostracization of a child born out of wedlock. Every child is sacred. If there is di a divorce, children live with their mother because we cannot imagine that children would live with the father and his clan. But the children are my clan. And the clan is a great support. They are a great support system to anyone who is destitute. For the Khasi man, what does it mean? He leaves his natal home. After marriage, he lives in his wife's house. Now that has some implications which I will come to later. Or maybe I'll come to it now. What, how does it impinge on the Khasi man? If we're looking at how uh, patriarchy has impinged upon women and their rights, I think it's also important to see what happens uh, alternatively. How does the Khasi man play out his role and how does it affect him or does it affect, does it affect him at all? The Khasi man has no authority over his own conjugal home or conjugal family because he lives in a big family where his children are being, you know, under the influence of so many elders. So he sometimes feel, feels very estranged in his own family. 
And the term we use for a man being married is like yang brew, which means he's going to somebody's house. In short, it means he does not any longer belong to his mother's house or his natal home. Now, we also have this system where the maternal uncle plays a very important role. So if a man who is my husband uh, does not have any control over his own children in his, in his wife's home, he does have some influence on his sister's children. He is considered very important to his own matric kin. He must be there to decide important functions, to decide on the dates of a wedding and so on and so forth. So he plays a role there. Now in my home, the maternal uncle or my brother plays a very important role as far as my children are concerned. Now I think it, it balances out because then my husband will have some role to play in his matriking. Maybe that is some balancing, balancing factor. <coughs> when a man marries, he, if he buys property, he buys it in his wife's name because he does not want his wife to be left in penury if he should die or if he should divorce her. Sometimes when the wife leaves, you know, he, or if he, if he dies before his wife, it happens that his, uh, his, his parents or his mother or his sisters lay claim on his property. So to avoid that, a man usually buys property in his own wife's name. Now, if we look at the institution of the Khaddu again, or the youngest daughter, we find that she has such an important role that if she does not produce a daughter, she is seen as sort of a curse because that would mean the end of the clan line as far as she is concerned. So what happens is that the, the daughter of the next elder sister becomes the inheritor, becomes the ancestress. <coughs> now this does not mean that sons cannot be given any kind of property. They can be given self-acquired property, but not ancestral property. Now when we look at the Kasi society, we need to see if there is any gender equity in that society. Or, because I do not want to romanticize this society, we want to look at reality as it is. What is the status of men vis-a-vis -vis women? Definitely, there is a greater value placed on daughters because they are the per perpetrators of lineage. But sons are not discriminated against. They get equal opportunities for education. However, the Khasi society, though it's a matrilineal one, it has very definite gender roles and gender division of labor. And that is the same as in other patriarchal societies. And it is very sad to say that women, we ourselves, very often look at the world through a patriarchal view. You know, although we live in a matrilineal, our world view is patriarchal. I do not know the reasons for that because we have not done enough studies on Kasi matrilineal, but we hope to be able to do a greater in-depth study. Because we have not understood our own roles, so this whole thing of uh, feminism and you know greater participation of women in politics, in society, is being, you know, this, this awareness is there now. We are fighting it out. <coughs> Matrilineal and poverty. In a matrilineal system, can you have poverty? Yes, because at one time the Khasi society believed in communitarian values. We believed in community ownership of land, the commons as you say, ownership, uh, common ownership of water sources, common ownership of forests, but after the British came and colonized that part of the world, land became a commodity and that's when the problem started. That's when the individualism also came in. Because the, the, the modern concept of development is so different from 
the traditional concept of development. Today we see that there are a few clans who own a lot of land and some individuals with no land at all. Otherwise, land used to be distributed among all members of the society. Not so much, but just enough for one homestead and a land for cultivation. That is not happening now and we find especially that uh, we have these rulers who we call the schemes who are appropriating more and more land. At one point of time, the aim or the ruler was just the first among equals. He, he did, did not need to own land or property. But now it's changed, you know, it's almost become like the concept of royalty. The British in their early writings have said that the Khasis are very democratic because they observed our, our uh, council meetings, which we call the Dorbans, and they felt that there was a lot of discussion before we came to any decision. Of course, there is consensus in decision making, but the, the British, perhaps in their patriarchal mindsets, did not see that the Khasi society is not democratic. It's very, uh, should I say, oligarchic, because only a few clans have the right to become the rulers, to become the schemes. Only a few clans have the right to become the ministers. The others who do not belong to those elite clans have no role to play in decision making. And I think uh, the system has become worse after the Indian democracy was imposed on us because after 1950, when Indian democracy was literally imposed on most of the tribes of the Northeast, because we were never part of India prior to 1947, when that Indian democracy was imposed, I think uh, it became more of a, what should I say, a vicious cycle. Now, what happens when a Khasi man marries outside his community? outside the Khasi community and this is happening very often now and why does it happen? I think the Khasi male lives in a sort of a very insecure world because he does not feel secure in his wife's family and he doesn't feel he has any stake in his mother's family so he's very insecure and he thinks that by marrying a non-Khasi he will have some control over lineage, you know. If he marries a non khasi maybe a Naga or a Mizo, then he gives his own clan name to the children and his wife. And the Khasi community has a ritual for this. When a Khasi man marries somebody who is a non khasi and that lady gives birth to children, then you have a ceremony called Tangjai, where a new clan name is given. The man cannot give his clan name to his wife, but a new clan name is born. Now I'd like to come to the challenges to Khasi matrimony. What are the challenges? And I think we have several challenges. The primary one being that we are moving towards a globalized world where people are trying to come in to build big dams. They are coming in with the concept of privatization of water privatization of mines and so on and so forth and the place where I live in, Meghalaya, has very rich uh, sources of uranium and there's a great attempt to mine that uranium at any cost. There is a tension between individual and nuclear family. More and more uh, married couples want to move out of their parental home and set up their own homes. The man is constantly under pressure of proving his loyalty to his wife's family or to his mother's family. He's caught in between and he tries to please both because he thinks he needs to be secure in both places. And I think that marriage really snatches a man away from his natal home, which is maybe not a very good idea. Maybe we need to find some balance there. Then the conflict between ownership and authority Though land is under the custodian of the youngest daughter, it is administered by her uncles and sometimes her brothers. So that also is a conflicting situation. 
The matrilocal residence of the man, as I said earlier, it brings about some ambiguity about his own role. And this has led to uh, greater cases of divorce. In Khasi society, divorce is very high and marriages are very brittle. And studies have also shown the increase in alcoholism. And the most recent study, in fact, have shown us that domestic violence is highest among the Khasis than all the other tribes of the Northeast. And that should give us something to think about. When I say domestic violence, I mean uh, violence, I mean violence by a man against a woman. Then the, the competition, the, the common property versus individual excellence that, that the global dimensions require from us. How do we fight back this, this uh, attempt to divide the community? <coughs> More men are marrying non khasis or outsiders and those who buy property then I mean, that property acquired through those sort of marriages are always in the name of men. So there is a change in the dynamism there. There is a greater threat because there is also the emergence of a very dominant male group seeking to bring changes from matrilineal to patrilineal. Though they are very small at the moment, but they might grow with time. Everything from good morning to good night to thank you. It's called Kublai. Kublai. And we say Kublai. Thank you. to introduce these books which are about Meghalaya and its culture. There are four of them uh, and I will leave them at the, at the desk outside but I would request that these books be not taken by anyone because they will have to be donated to the Academia Hagia. Thank you.